Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, nau mai, haere mai, ki Whangarei Takua Hui, tai te rua te kou whiringa a nuku. That's uh, Thursday the 22nd of October. Welcome everybody. Um, before we start, I would like to ask Councillor Go Lightly to open our meeting with the karakia. Kia tou, te ranga Māori e. Kia whakatapua, tātou, katoa. Mina mia, whakapunu, ana, tātou. Let there be peace amongst us. Let us have respect for each other and what we believe. Thank you. Councillors, a reminder that if there are any items on our agenda today for which you have an interest, please declare those at the beginning of the, the item. Uh, we have an apology from Councillor Cooper today. Can I have somebody move that we uh, accept his apology? Councillor Cockerillo is moving, Councillor Innes is seconding. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against, carried. Our first item on the agenda today is the public forum, page two of our agenda. Today we have Robin Lethbridge, who is the chair of the Positive Ageing Advisory Group, um, to speak to us in our public forum. Welcome, Robin. Um, it's lovely to have you in our chamber again. Uh, and I believe that she's got a significant number of the positive ageing, positive advisory group members with them today, with her today. So perhaps before we um, start your you know, five minutes on the clock, Robin, yes. um, I wonder if, if your members um, could stand and just introduce themselves. I'd like that, yes. Uh. <laughs> 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 she's the <laughs> In the next decade, there will be more people aged over 65 than children 0 to 14 years. And Northland has the second highest number of people over 65, with 18.3%. It is most heartening that housing is one of the areas of focus that you've indicated for your long-term plan. As Chair of your Positive Ageing Advisory Group, I want to focus on the special needs of older people in housing. Putting aside those who can afford to pay $600,000 or $800,000 to live in a retirement village, there are three categories of older people's needs in housing that I want to centre on. And all of these are addressing the opportunity to provide smaller houses and releasing family homes for those who need them. Firstly, we are aware there is a waiting list now of 20 for the existing pension houses come supplies. We ask that council address this shortfall by including the building of four units per annum and budgeting to achieve this. And I have some figures that you can refer to later. Further, the council allows an equivalent of 5,000 per unit per annum for maintenance of existing stock. We're concerned that that's been only at about 3,700. It's not maintaining your stock to a standard that we think you should be meeting. Secondly, Council recognises that increasing numbers of older people are retiring while still having a mortgage. And as families are not managing to finance their first house until in their 30s and 40s, these numbers are going to grow. Right now, there are widows and widowers who have some assets and would like to downsize, release their worries about large gardens and house maintenance, while freeing up family homes, but there is no available stock. So to address this we recommend. 
counseled partners with older adults by investing in small house, small village partnerships, creating sustainable, pleasant environments. And you can refer to Auckland Council's own your own unit for older people. This reflects your growth strategy, recognising the need for public investment to stimulate private investment. If Council would invest a million in year one, and recover through the partnership sale of the unit titles, say 500,000. This could be reinvested by topping it up with 500,000 each following year. In five years, you could have created 20 partnered small houses helping to meet the increasing demand. Thirdly, that council actively promotes this need to developers creating subdivisions. In your growth strategy, you state identification and partnering with stakeholders, which could include with local housing providers. That suggests that small village and small unit designs are made available as examples, keeping consenting to a minimum with repeat design. So think of a, a village, four units, they're all the same, consent one, and the, the designs are repeated, not each one having to go through. Uh, this would mean another demand of older people was sufficient to buy outright. Please find attached the concept plan of a 50 square metre small house and of a small village and the costings based on the current market. I have been to two building companies and got the prices of building a 50 square metre, 48 square metre uh, unit. And so I've done the maths. Um, and looking at the cost of a site, for instance, in Parkland, Totara Parkland, you're looking at 270 for a site, and that of course includes your development costs, so that is the cost of a site, and you're going to put, say, four small houses on it, the cost of a 50 square metre is around 127,000. Landscaping, I've allowed at 10,000, I've put consents for four at 20,000, but I'm hoping you can soon one, and that in fact comes down. On site drainage and sewer, 7,000 by four at 28,000. Power connection, 750 by four, coming to 3,000. Brings the total for a four unit village to 844,000, which comes down to 211,000 per unit. So, what we're saying is that this is a very cost effective way of meeting the obvious demands that are out there for our older people and that that population <coughs> is increasing and we need to try and get ahead of it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I did not plan this, you know. <laughs> I did not set this up, um, and I uh, um, just want to congratulate Robin for the amount of work she's done, though I have to say the positive ageing group is, is strongly behind this, I know that. Um, I just had a, just to check, Robin, the consenting issue, are you suggesting that there would be like one consent for the whole build rather than a consent per unit? That's right, because I could see, for example, in terms of marketing this, and I would see private people getting involved, build one unit and off that you sell all the others. And if that unit is to be identically copied, once it's consented, there shouldn't have to be costs going on and on for more consenting for the others. That's what I'm talking about. That's Thank you. Um, you must have been tuning in because we were talking about this yesterday. I'm just wondering, have you surveyed 50 square metres is quite small and we talked about either um, people would be looking for maybe a one or a two bedroom unit and I suppose 50 square metres is just one yes. bedroom. Yes. I'm just wondering if you identified that, that people you know, are satisfied with just um, that size? Look, you've, you've hit the nail because obviously yes it needs to be taken further to look at two bedroom units, you're quite right. Um, but interestingly enough, the heap of information about small houses now on Google, you can just go in and, and put in there 50 square metres, 60 square metres, all that pop up. Um, this one was done for us 
privately and just to support what we're doing. But um, I think the whole shift now, and there are companies, burgeoning companies in Walmart coming on board to develop small houses. And I think that's the move that we've got to start to move into as a society, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Robin, and, and um, as always, thank you for the research that you put into that and your team. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, just a, a housekeeping matter before we move into the next item. Um, item 7.4, the adoption of our 2019-20 annual report is withdrawn from the agenda today, and we will be addressing that at our earliest convenience. The next uh, item on our agenda is our police report, and I'd like to um, warmly welcome your friend, um, Martin Green. Welcome, Martin. Good evening, everyone. <coughs> So since my last, uh, since we last spoke, uh, we've confirmed funding for. I'll give you the good news first. Um, we've confirmed funding for a Tipai Oranga based here in Wangarei, which is an adult uh, first, second, third time pathway for uh, a system outside the justice system. So we're not chucking our first time out of the fingers into that justice pipe in Australia. It's looking very well in Kaikoui. Blue Light have moved into Te Oroho together with a couple of youth aid officers working out of there for two or three days a week. Uh, we've got some great, uh, some great ideas and uh, to keep the back in the better and uh, offer them a new space. Martin, if you wouldn't mind just picking sure. up a little, thank you. Yep. Um, a serious crime victimisation that is your burglaries, uh, your, your cars getting stolen, your trailers. Summer policing is going to be big for us. Um, there's no secrets there with the restrictions on travel. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to be real busy in the summer on our roads, at our beaches, uh, in our cities, and we, we're planning for that. Uh, we've been planning for about, about three weeks. And uh, there's going to be more police on duty over the Christmas summer period than we've had probably in many, many years. Um, and also, some good news on the family violence front. Uh, they've landed two more. Uh, non sworn roles, uh, Kai Fina positions, which will uh, work with uh, those peak families uh, that uh, keep coming to our attention all the time uh, to work with the underlying uh, causes of uh, violence and bits and pieces that are going on in their lives. So uh, it's a real win for us. So we'll go out and talk with those repeat victims, families who are coming to our attention all the time and work with the underlying causes of what's going on in their home with NGOs and other government departments. So that's a big, big one for us. Um, negative, but not so positive. Uh, not too much really, but I'm sure the questions fall down over you think it's still coming up. <laughs> oh, probably, probably we're seeing a little bit, uh, a bit of a rise of alcohol related crime in CBD, uh, which was anticipated post COVID. And alcohol sales are Serious assaults on CBD in recent months. Uh, CIB are investigating a particularly nasty one along the Wall Street at the moment, uh, which uh, I can't share with you the details, but uh, yeah, haven't seen that for a while. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's just some stuff that we get from the team to all. That's it from me. Thank you, Marty. Councillors, mm -hmm. I bet there's a number of messages going <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, Marty, when it comes to the CBD, is there um, an extra police presence now? Yeah, so we've, we've uh, we, I think I alluded to this last time, we've, we've uh, 
guess the word is restructured. Uh, a lot of our staff have got more people working in the dark and weekends now than we've ever had. Uh, some of the groups that sort of uh, traditionally work are, uh, a day shift, uh, they're now required to work uh, late some, and some weekends. Uh, so we're getting more staff out of uh, our patrol uh, in the uh, peak hours, the peak delivery hours. Of course, that, that pitch is changing again. Uh, so we've just got the agile change with it. So you should see more people out on the road. I know there are more out there. You can see uh, someone got a coffee machine. I would anticipate they'd be out there doing business doing So just to clarify then, uh, <coughs> you're actually saying you have more staff now. So there are more staff uh, rostered on uh, peak demand areas, which is your Friday, Saturday night, uh, than there has ever been. So we've got more people working, uh, concentrating on our demand, our peak, peak periods, peak areas, than probably we've ever had. And, and you've also got more staff coming to Northland now? Because I know there was an issue there before not getting many staff. Or you oh, so the, the P21 allocations was 84. Yeah. We were in probably about, I think we're in the early 70s or the late 60s in terms of those. Those are extra numbers. So that's organised crime, uh, precision targeting team, which the team is still up in the uh, So they're going after your high risk offenders, your, uh, your bracelet cutters, uh, your rebar, the breaches, and bits and pieces like that. So they're particularly targeting that high risk group, uh, that, that get caught bail, cut off their bracelet and go, uh, and your high risk offenders that do get caught bail. So uh, that team is concentrating in that space. Uh, and they've, they've been, uh, the last, last month, they've, they've, their uh, results have been very, 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 very promising. So, uh, you know, once those that particular group of people, once they cut off their email bracelet, they tend to uh, get very busy. One of, one of the again through one of the comments that we constantly get back in here is um, when a road gets closed because of fatality mm. and the time delay it takes for the for the road to get back opened again. Mm. Now we, we know that there's there's a whole pile of police procedures that have got to happen. Yeah. Is there a I understand there's only two staff for the whole of Northland. Is there, is there a chance that that might increase to allow more? So probably with our serious crash uh, team, uh, there's, I think the, the strength is two. Um, and we put a detective sergeant in there, uh, which is something that's you know, quite, quite different from years gone by, uh, to oversee the, the fatals uh, and the investigations. Uh, some of you might know Peter Serpentine. Nice guy and uh, very, very good detective. So he's a detective sergeant attached to that team. So he oversees the investigations right from the start, reviews the evidence and, and helps because we, we have a number of uh, less than perfect uh, um, fatal investigations in there which sort of stammered on a bit too long and, and, and a bit, bit messy, whether that be in the coronial space or, or uh, in the court. Of course, there's a statute of limitations that you have to abide by. So uh, we're pretty happy with our service here. Uh, we think the, the public uh, are pretty happy, which is most important. Uh, and of course our favourites are not going up. Not saying they're going down, but they're not going up. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Peters, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, <coughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering about whether you are still arguing for more super staff in the area because um, particularly to do with uh, daytime beat like Councillor Cockerilla during in the CBD um, and also um, the response time, Open Arms is noticing that the response time is quite slow when they have a major incident which unfortunately is quite regularly. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a, is there room to, to argue for more um, cops during the day? Yes, mm. is your answer. Uh, however, um, th there is a process. Uh, like I said, we've, I think Warren Cop has received uh, over 40 extra staff in the last two years, and we've got a few more to come in. Uh, youth organised crime and uh, uh, that precision targeting team is very helpful. Uh, got an extra dog handler based here in Warren, so uh, uh, you could argue every day for more staff, but. Mm -hmm. We all know the reality of life and finding a 
subjects and business and cars. You know, you have to sometimes do <coughs> what you want and you just want to do the best you can with what you've got. Yeah. Um, is there still a direct connection between the alarms and the police station, or is that that seems to be moderated now? Is that um, the alarms? Yeah, you know, when you've got an uh, emergency at the alarm for the frontline staff. We used to have that, but you hit the button and the police came. Uh, so we've got our own, which are called out, which is just a big red button on the mm. base. Mm. So once they push that, everyone comes running. That's for our own staff. But you don't have that now. It used to. No, we've, we've had that for the last five, seven years, and we still do. Right, but I mean for, for frontline staff of uh, the community groups, like... Um, so that's not linked in, I'm not aware of that being linked in with anything other than uh, medical or anything like that. I don't know. If, if there's a panic alarm, it'll be monitored by an alarm company. It's not linked to the police. Right. And they, those are the ones, uh, if they activate, they, they ring us. They oh, start right. responding. So it's mediated, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's never been linked to us. The <coughs> personal body alarms or house alarms have never been linked for about 35 years to the police. Thank you. That's Martin. Yeah. <coughs> Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's huge um, concern in the Hagarini community that the police are uh, not going to replace the staff that are there. And um, I think that over the last <coughs> certainly 30 odd years where we've had two police, and then some of the relieving guys have been excellent as well. <coughs> but when you've got people permanently there, the community are comfortable to talk to them, they know they're there and they're just up the road. So it's had a huge effect and, and the community are concerned as you probably had in these emails and letters and I've had the calls and stuff. So it's it's important um, for, for our community and they're very, very concerned that um, you know with the centralisation that's going on everywhere that maybe <coughs> it's going to happen as well. But, so that's one question. Okay, uh, simply put, uh, we have advertised the two Hipparini positions. Uh, we've looked at a roster that we think serves uh, peak demand in the community. Uh, we want, uh, in this modern environment, we have to ensure that uh, our staff are open to it wherever they can. So the old uh, days where there was one person on call doesn't kind of work for us now. Uh, so we have to have two men, uh, considering it's only 10 minutes from town. There will be two officers based at the green, we just got to fill the positions. So this is the first time we've advertised it. Probably the delay, if I can explain, is a couple of people wanted to try out at green, uh, to see if they were interested. Uh, yeah, they can look at as well as we would like. Uh, probably the jobs have been advertised in there in our, our uh, promotion uh, advertising system, now, which is new and caused us about uh, three weeks delay. The police station isn't going anywhere. I can't guarantee that the new staff will be living in the police house. Um, the, the police station's not going anywhere and they will be using it. Well, that's the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> the next thing is, um, at the regional transport committee, we were told that um, there's a new um, team policing for traffic that's going to be moving to the funnel. Yes. Yes. Is that going to be operating in Walgrave? Uh, so um, we have all our highway patrol units, so most of the highway patrol units, if I can talk about the spare staff, the Genesis Genesis, <coughs> most of them are based here in Wangarei Cobra. So uh, you get the better benefit, you get the, uh, because they're based here, uh, mm -hmm. the population is here, our highways uh, here, uh, you tend to get a far, Far better uh, coverage uh, in effect uh, in the close to, to a big city. The rural roads are obviously a concern for us. A lot of people are, uh, have favours are on rural roads, particularly in the farm. Uh, but um, believe me, we get a very, very good deal here for our uh, road policing based units here in uh, Wild So we get a far better uh, portion of people. Therefore, you get a far better proportion of police staff. That's how it works. Any 
anything, just to finish. I don't know if anybody ever tells me. We're very grateful for the job you do at Kiwi. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's some good news there. I think I'm not sure what I told you last time. So we used to be the worst. Uh, mm. uh, so the, the the science is pretty. So it's uh, it's measured uh, by the sewage system and it's uh, mm. biomass really is it? It's not pour off if one was cooking with uh, They used to pour it all down the toilet just to go into waterways and there'd be some pretty bad stuff and leaching into our soils and, and bits and pieces, so the biomass reading is stuff that's gone through the body, and yeah. it's quite scientific, so uh, no secret, uh, we were the worst city in New Zealand yeah. of all sewage readings, which is quite right. so uh, we're now number five, oh. so uh, oh, we're slipping, <laughs> <laughs> in the right <laughs> I know that's a small one, uh, yeah. but it's, look, it's, it's, it's positive, yeah. and, and we're getting back in that space. Just in the news and looking at comparisons, uh, the Wellington uh, central area has been uh, in terms of uh, violence and sexual assaults. And uh, what's come out of that uh, is really uh, a high presence. Uh, they're saying that uh, there hasn't been a high presence in terms of uh, Wellington central as much as other areas. Uh, and I just wondered in terms of violence, you mentioned that there's additional resourcing. Is there a, a strong presence in the streets? Uh, or, or is it something that you wait to react? But it seemed that the information coming out of uh, discussion on Wellington was important. Yeah, it was important to have a presence. Being visible uh, and being in the prevention space for policing is, is, uh, is there's gold for this. Oh, uh, yeah. for us and the public at the end of that. So it's not all about reacting in a timely manner, it's about getting in the prevention space, being seen, being visible, being on the beat, uh, you know, stopping and talking to people, those you know, high concentrations of people, public place, uh, <coughs> and visibility is important. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's always been, uh, going back many years, a uh, focus. <coughs> Problems come probably when you're demand and so bad you get drawn out of that space yeah. and you respond to the problem. So uh, we've, we've got our structure right, we think. Uh, we think it's uh, victim centric, it's what the public want, we're talking to them all the time. Uh, the, more, the more start we get in that visibility, being there, doing it, talking to people, yeah. walking through the wall, uh, going to school, talking to people, the better off what we've got. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Um, just coming back to the meth question, um, I'm really happy, I'm happy that we're fifth, you know, but is that, would you say that's because we have, we have dropped or have we remained the same and other people come on at the top? That's no, so uh, I, I don't want to speak about other districts because that's, it's their thumb, but um, the data I've seen which is very clear and very scientific. We, we're probably getting back into the, uh, the organised crime space more uh, than we have been because uh, we've got the numbers to do it. Uh, COVID gave us an opportunity. Uh, the only people out there were the meth were the gangs. They were the only people on the road, so they weren't they're pretty easy to spot. Um, and and uh, since then, um, yeah, so we, we had some really great apprehensions in that uh, space. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things happening in the organised crime space, which is good for us uh, in terms of uh, an all government approach. Uh, you know, uh, it's not just the police, it's the customs, it's the public. 
you've seen what happens in Archipara when the lives are spun up. So, look, this, this team is, uh, you guys need to get in here and some of these guys on the beach. And, uh, they're up. Mm -hmm. and a couple of days later, we have a ton of camera, uh, sorry, a ton of methane field. And so, um, uh, it's a growth area for us. It's grown back to where it was many years ago. And the consequence of that is you have the least methane field in your community. It's simple. So it's been a drop in Northland rather than us remaining the same and others getting worse, is that what you're saying? It's been a drop no, in Northland? I think it's, it's been a drop in Northland uh, because of some, uh, because we're getting back in that space uh, and we're getting some more focus. We need to. Uh, but it's a combination of many, many things that are quite complex. Uh, these groups set themselves up. We've got big issues with our good friends across the Tasman who are uh, uh, people failing fail in the 501 test and, and there's a few people coming in every week to the airport, 501 is. Uh, some of those people have spent <coughs> two or three years in New Zealand and lived their whole lives in Australia. So they arrive at Mangere Airport but, uh, uh, with a few dollars in their pocket and uh, they migrate back to the gangs very quickly. So that's a big, big problem for us. No secrets there, that's well known. And so, necessarily going to the cities, they're going to the smaller districts. <coughs> that's a very complex issue, but I'm pleased to say that we've seen some better results and we, we aim to make it better. Councillor Murphy, thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Um, obviously, you've been here as a serious issues, but this one I'd like to raise isn't quite on the same scale, yeah. but it's just good opportunity. Um, and on the Tunikanka coast, we, we're seeing on particularly Friday, Saturday nights, just a heap of vandalism, uh, tagging on trees, that kind of damage. Just wondering with the summer policing, will that include evening patrols? Because um, hopefully, you know, just having a cruise out back in the evening could... Yep, so uh, long story short, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it's it's on the uh, peak demand, so we've got back over five years. Uh, we're a peak village, if you like, uh, we get our demand back. Uh, surprisingly, uh, it's very, very little at the beach, but we're planning for what is probably uh, going to be a bigger summer for a long time. Uh, there's travel restrictions, flooding. <coughs> Keeping to come north, it's beautiful north, and spend their uh, summer and have a quiet drink and enjoy the beaches. That's great because yeah, the, days, the days are fine, it's, it's you know, after dark, it is. It is. that's when um, yeah. the drinks happen. So. Uh, over the years, we've tried to do the best with the alcohol ban, the fire ban, that's, that's mm -hmm. just a goal for, uh, for us in the public in terms of stopping those little, mm -hmm. those little things. It's just, Change, change the whole face. Thank you. That's a bit. Very good not to. Um, so we've been following on from the summer policing. That was my so I a few years ago cut back the the, the amount of time spent for the summer cop of policing. Will, will the officers be based at the summer locations? So we're probably going to run a summer uh, a, a kind of a central model. So the work from the station, depending on where the demand is. So we don't know where the demand is yet. Uh, so if to the car car, perhaps uh, if we get a bigger demand out there, if we get a bigger demand at one tree point or a car for white poop, we can move those pieces on the chessboard a lot quicker. If we send them to Harani and the demand is in the south, we just got to pull them out of there and send them south. So one and a half places you used to go gather all the time. We're going to run a central to the beaches on a daily basis rather than put them with a, at, the, at the stations like White and Red Cape and bits and pieces so we can move people around quickly. And, and I mean, so the, the ideal thing in, in the old days was that the cops were, for a much, they were stationed at yeah. the Oaka, mm -hmm. um, Tutukaka, and places like that, but there's none of that anymore. No, so uh, the demand picture for that stuff last five years, you'd be quite surprised. It's not great. And I know that doesn't mean we catch all the crime because we know only about 40% of crime is actually reported. You know, if you haven't got someone there. But we are sending officers out to the beaches during the day and the evening to manage that. Uh, but we'd rather have a 
central pole, so if things get a bit unruly or, or you have some problems in one particular area, that's where most of the resources are going to go. If we put them to Wainaki and there's no demand, everyone's happy. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the theory. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so if we can carry it, just, so, and one of the issues, we, we, with our fire bans, alcohol bans, the, the, the driving on beaches is a big one that comes up all the time with that. It's happening, but there's no cops there to do it, and, and therefore, if there's no statistics, there's no, it's it's not happening as such, but we all know it is happening, and it's, a, it's that preventative policing that, that works, and I, and I understand it's budget constraints and all that sort of thing, it's, with our freedom camping is another one that's it's just great to have the, the cops on side with that. So maybe that's something we can um, work towards and continue to push. So. Yeah, I, I think you'd be quite pleased with the numbers we're putting in. Uh, it's it's more than we ever have. Uh, and, and it's, it's smart policing. It's not just putting some of the water in for a month and you know, do two jobs over the whole month. You know. but of, course, <coughs> of course, they're actually preventing the whole lot of crime. I know what you're saying. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So, thank you. Any further questions? Marty, I have one. Um, clearly, you know, we are concerned about the same people um, and the, their health and safety. One of the things that we're doing as a, as a council is investing in the City Safe program, and some would argue that we're, we're doing the police job by having our, um, our people that the rate guys <coughs> are um, providing support for. But in that sort of partnership model, um, can, I, can you just give us a reflection on your thoughts on how that is working and, and where that could go in the future? Because um, we're building our long-term plan. Are we going to need to put more money into this? Um, because we'd rather not. I hear what you're saying, you know, Your Worship. Uh, look, City Safe has been a, a godsend for us. Uh, it's another set of eyes and ears. Those people do a wonderful job. Uh, they sit back and, and advise us, they see, uh, it's another set of eyes and ears out there in the, in the CBD during peak periods and uh, if you had a cop on every street corner you'd still miss stuff, you know what I mean? And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a godsend for us, uh, I, I work, partner with the City Safe and the Council as uh, long as, and as hard as we can because it's a great, great uh, aid to us in the public. Really, um, it's not just you know, it's that preventative role we've talked about. It's about being out there and, and, and actually being visible. People won't do something city safe so coming in the corner because they know that they can pass up the trips really, really quickly. Uh, yeah. uh, so look, it's uh, it's been great for us. So I want support us and speak uh, highly. It's, uh, it's, it's great for us. Yeah, they certainly do a good ambassadorial role as well. Yeah, it's, it's not just a crime prevention, it's, it's other stuff that they do and see and the effect that they have uh, just being out there and talking to people. It's, it's great. So, from the Worship's question there, just if you prefer our council to invest more into it? Oh, yeah, I don't want to be agreed, but uh, look, uh, from our perspective, uh, that kind of ambassador, uh, you know, we saw the car park ambassadors, they just completely cut their crime out, it's, it's just gone. Uh, you have the, Gav talks about, um, the, the, if you have those ambassadors, those kaitiaki uh, looking after those places, the beaches, it just dies off. It's the same in the city. So uh, if you have some, uh, those resources out there, you're looking for that stuff, talking to people, people feel safer, there is less crime. Uh, we get it reported and we respond a hell of a lot quicker. Uh, they're smart, they're operating smart. You know, they're not stepping into dangerous positions. They know with the training that they've had, they're not putting themselves at risk. They're sitting back watching, listening, recording, and uh, guys, you need to get here quickly. And that's what's happening. So, just one last question. Sorry. Um, Marty, with, with the uh, CBD, we've got the um, city patrol guys in, in the vehicle, we've got the yep. um, city safe, we've got the security cameras, yep. and, and we've got yourselves. Is there anything else that you think we need to add to make the district safer? So it's no secret we've, uh, we've partnered with you for that uh, AMPR capability, I know, uh, which is automatic number plate recognition. So. Uh, I can tell you, we're 100 miles away, it's, uh, 
it's working very, very well. Uh, we're picking up uh, on Monday morning, as I'm, I'm told, uh, 12 or 13 stolen cars coming out of South Auckland, just being on the motorway off ramps and being told that these, things, these vehicles are rolling out. That's just stolen vehicles. So, uh, um, yeah, if, if you focus on that, uh, AMPR capability, uh, you know, that technology we need to use, as long as we don't impinge on, on uh, people's privacy. Uh, you know the CCTV story, we've all heard it. Uh, AMPR is uh, a reasonable, uh, there's no expectation of privacy in those circumstances. Uh, stolen cars on road mean, means more crime. They need the car to do petrol drivers to go and do burglaries. Um, the more we can we can catch those people, prevent that happening, the better off we'll be. So the next logical step for me, you know, Vince, what we're trying to do in that space. So we're just waiting on a couple of uh, funding applications, and if we, if we get the green light, it's going to be uh, it's going to help us. You know, we've had uh, some some pretty uh, dramatic vehicle. Made some good deeds in it, but the technology just makes it so much easier. Cool. So, any questions? Mm -hmm. I can I reinforce that comment of um, our great thanks to you and your teams keeping our people safe. Um, really, really appreciate it and um, enjoying this uh, dialogue that we can have with you. Thank you for all of your time. It's a privilege. Thank you. Councillors, we have a recommendation that um, Council note the report. Uh, can we have a move on that? Councillor Martin has moved. And Councillor Collins has moved. Those in favour, aye. Against. Carried. I keep that. Move to item 6.1, the uh, minutes from our meeting on Thursday, the 24th of September, which also included a confidential section. Can I have somebody move that they are true to the correct record of that meeting? Councillor Peters has moved. Councillor Cutcliffe is second. Just, um, just a question, Your Worship. Yes, page 16. Not apart from people obviously coming and going during the meeting at different times. <coughs> One on the page 16, while I know Councillor Phil Hulse often does have varying opinions on things. <laughs> I note this time he called for a division and voted both for and against. <laughs> I'm so I see we didn't notice that uh, Australians <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> I mean it's not a, a non unusual occurrence but this time we actually recorded it, so perhaps we just need to change that. <laughs> That's what experience brings to the change. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for highlighting that correction that is required. <laughs> I will now second. Are there any other amendments uh, or corrections to the minutes, including the confidential minutes section? And if not, I will put that motion as in favour. Aye. Aye. Against. Garrett. Item 6.7.1. Uh, uh, the risk management policy and supporting framework. Welcome, Emily. Councillors, um, I will take this report as having been read. Um, and work through in detail. Can I have a move for the recommendation? Councillor Pogorillo is moving the recommendation on page 22 and Councillor Peters is seconding. Councillor Pogorillo. Um, through Madam Chair, look, I think the, the obvious thing is, is this is a very comprehensive report, uh, the policy, we've gone through it several times amongst the councillors. Uh, the staff have produced it, you know, again, we've gone through clarifying the whole report with us. I, I can't really argue with what's there. It's very self-explanatory and it's explaining the safety of the risks and how our staff are to respond to them, which is great. And as, as a council, as governors, how we are to deal with the risks. So I really do appreciate that. And I will stress that you how we appreciate the staff to be able to put some information together for us. So um, I, as I said, I'm happy to move it. No problems with that at all. Councilor Cockrell, any further discussion? Councilor um, yeah, I, I brought this up when we were discussing this prior, um, and my main point is the fact that we've got, so risk is, is risk, it's the potential, where is it gone? A situation involving exposure to danger or, the, or something with loss or harm. So basically it's, it's, it's negative for Dunlop. And yet, and where, where is it gone? We've got on page 27, 
that we've got the um, <coughs> negative risk and the positive risk. Now, these are outcomes rather than risks. Risk is, it is what it is. And yet the whole rest of the document doesn't actually state anything else about positive risks, even though we state it here. So there is only the only chance of negative risks happening, catastrophic to low. Now, when you get up to a low risk, it gets into the benefits, there's, there's the benefits things. But the positive, once it gets to that area, it turns back, because if it's too much of a positive, it turns back into a negative. So I just wanted to raise that point that even though we've saved positive risk, risk is itself, but it's the outcomes are negative or positive in our view. But also there's no other positive outcomes throughout the document really. I did highlight this part. Great. Emily, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I only just wanted to highlight that um, there was definitely a feeling that once the election was deleted, check we recognised the opportunity for risk, and that is in the policy and the framework. You are noting today the framework, and we are hoping through the maturity of our risk programme, we'll actually put some more um, pieces around that to have positivity, positive risk. That's all it is. Possibly even call them opportunities and risks, and that will get rounded. I particularly like your. A diagram on page 33 and that you have included strategic risks um, as was discussed in, in detail because um, those are sorts of things that, that we as councillors actually really need to be aware of. Thank you. Any further discussion? I just want to put, I support what's in the agenda, sure, but the um, is how we start implementing in the, the creep of this into, the, into our contractors, the creep of this into anyone who has any contact with council, as employees or contractors or whatever. And I just want to cite an example of what's what happened in, in our roading at the moment, risk and the safety methods they've got to do to, to or what they are currently implementing, and I presumably to, to qualify to get a, get a, to get a contract. I walked up Mill Road the other day at a major operation, and guess how many cars are out there? Mm -hmm. you know, and all the roads were closed Mill Road. So going up the road, Parahaki Street, etc., etc., they were all closed off. And so they couldn't, no one could get onto the Mill Road. So I thought I'd, I'd count the cones, just as, as an example, as we And you know, 800 metres? 100 cones? No. 200 cones? No. Well, guess what? 670 pin cones. <laughs> and I might have missed a couple. Yeah. Now, how far have we got to go to make people know this or be safe? And I, I don't want to see a good framework like that being abused or over exaggerated where our ratepayers are paying for it. Our ratepayers are paying for all those cones we put out there. So that is one thing we need to concentrate. 670 road cones. And that doesn't include all the stop signs or any of that stuff. But just for information, I thought I'd get it out there. Do you advocate short out? No, it's to stop one. Thank you, Councillor Hobbs. Henceforth, you'll be known as Cone Cut Hobbs. When you go for a walk, that's what you do. Yeah. Any further discussion on the uh, risk framework? Okay. So, Cobra, would you like a, uh, your rush reply? Sure, I, I have no problem with the right reply on this. Um, the council, so Council Hoss has raised an interesting point about the 670 cones. Uh, I do need to point out, though, that is an operational thing, not a, a risk for as as, as as excellence and the deals that we have to deal with uh, as such. It, it, it is something we, we do need to be quite well aware of that. Um, Safety is something that needs to be done amongst all of our contractors, and we should never really take it for granted that, um, how do I put it, there are risks within their industry and they know their risks best. So, as, as, but as, as in relation to this report, as in relation to what Emily introduced for us for here, look, I, I do again stress in how um, well it's been written and clearly written to define those risks for councillors and council. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 u
those in favour, aye. 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 Against? Carried. Item 7.2, the adoption of the statement of proposal for amendment of the Campion Public Places Bible and Associated Amendments to the Public Places Bible. Councillor Cobb is on speed. We'd like to move the recommendations as um, noted on page 46. Councillor Cobb is moving to be the seconder. Councillor Cobb. Um, good morning. <coughs> this one is a particular issue that is not going away. The fact that we have a very desirable home, a very desirable tourist location, a very desirable environment that so many people want to be able to come in and visit, we need to do this right. We have to make sure that we get this appropriate for everybody. The perception of a lot of people on freedom campers, on vehicle dwellers, on homeless people, on outliers can contrast greatly. With so many issues that we're experiencing, we need to make, need to make sure that we are doing them appropriately. Recently, well, if, with the perception of vehicle dwellers of freedom campers and whatnot. We have to make sure that the staff that are dealing with these are dealing with them appropriately as well. And the perception of it can't be harassment. Because recently there have been issues coming up and I'm glad that we're being dealt with, but it can't go on like that. We need to do things appropriately. Whereas somebody might be a vehicle dweller, somebody might be a freedom camper, where is the line drawn and at what point in time? With people going to the beach, they can go in a truck, they can go in on their bike, they can go in a, in, a, in a camper van. At what point in time do they turn from a freedom camper, from the public, from a shopper, where they're allowed to park, where they're not allowed to park. If somebody's sleeping during the day, if somebody's sleeping during the night, there's so many different options and accessibilities that if you only view it through a certain lens, you only get seen. Now, if we don't do this right, we're going to have an issue with the vehicle dwellers, and we've heard that. They've stated it. They are around freedom campers quite often, obviously, because they have to be in similar locations. Now, making sure that we look at both, and all the different areas separately, and I appreciate as well that we are looking at the, through the, the information here, that it is from freedom campers, from people to life, et cetera. But we need to make sure it's not, they're not lumped into one view because people will anyway. Um, we need to be able to mitigate the issues and I'm really glad to see that the Freedom Camping Ambassadors this year will have, have reached out and said, is there any, any local Kaitiaki people, that, any local com conservation groups that would like to say, hey, would you like to come along and help out? And that way, it mitigates the issue of saying, oh, they're just, they're just freelancers, they're not doing anything. Countless times I've had people saying at, our, at my place for, through couch surfing, which, and they're freedom campers as well, and they've been out, out there looking at the place, the, our, our country, picking up rubbish and doing the right thing. Generally, they're good. We need to make sure that when we're putting framework in place, or whatever you call it, that it's, it's a coverall. It's not just the freedom campers because are we allowing, when it says only one camper van to one space, are two cars allowed to park in that space? What about a truck and trailer? What about a. There's so many different sizes of vehicles and different spaces. And if people are traveling in convoy or a couple of different vehicles, and there's only one space, and the other person then has to potentially go somewhere else. Another issue is often we, just recently, um, at the beginning of the meeting, we had complaints about people um, tagging and littering and doing all those bits and pieces because nobody is in the area to supervise those things. We, oh, we want more police there. But if we have evidence in the area, we actually mitigate that too because if we have somebody there looking after the place, the, the potential of people doing donuts, leaving rubbish, starting pallet fires on the beach and leaving rubbish all around the place, they're not being brought by, um, by freedom campers. These people are locals. We have so many issues that we have to spread out to the locals as well if we're looking to expect the freedom campers to adhere by these two. They get tarred with the same brush. When there's rubbish in one place, you park up in this location, it's going to happen. 
At the same time, what is the amenity of 100 cars versus 100 campgrounds? At the same time, if we're providing spaces that are only so big, and we're complaining that they're using gas cookers outside of their, their cars, and we haven't provided any extra space, well, that's our infrastructure that we're implementing. If we, if I went to the beach and I stood up and sit at my camper, camp cooker up at the back of my car, am I then freedom camping, or am I just going to the beach and going to the beach? There's so many different <coughs> fine lines that the division <coughs> can fall on that we need to make sure we get this thing right. If we don't do it properly, if we don't provide infrastructure, if we don't provide an opportunity for them to work with us, freedom campers, vegan dwellers, homeless, whatever, we're going to get it wrong. And if we're a freedom camping friendly district, well, are we? Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to uh, first of all acknowledge uh, the work that staff have um, undertaken on. on Area. It's an area that, of course, uh, as uh, Councillor Connor has uh, stated, is that uh, it's an area of considerable interest, uh, and there has been a level of conflict. Uh, and I suppose, it, and that will continue to a certain extent. But uh, I'm familiar, really, with um, uh, the Fomaray Heads Ward, uh, which I get uh, a lot of. Uh, phone calls in, in relation to this, but I just want to say that um, the fine tuning that's going on and going in consultation again, uh, I pick up uh, two aspects in terms of this as it relates to the heads. And um, the first one relates to the Te Araroa uh, walkers. And I think uh, looking at what we've done here recognises them, uh, provides for their needs. Uh, as it relates to Riatahi, the, the local community have been very much into that solution approach to that, uh, and it's uh, good to see that that will go out for discussion. The, the other aspect really relates to uh, protecting access to um, beaches. And uh, at Ocean Beach, uh, there was an overflow area there, grass area, uh, of which uh, Freedom Campers uh, uh, were occupying over the last summer period that created problems in terms of public access to that beach. And I'm pleased to see that with consultation uh, with the local community, that's been resolved. Additional places have been put in the sealed car park uh, for Freedom Campers and the overflow uh, area is just kept for uh, people visiting uh, the beach. So um, I look forward to the hearings on the 8th of December uh, and if we can keep uh, momentum going on this, uh, I think it's something that will continue to fine tune. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ernest. Councillor Martin. Yes, well, <coughs> I was just looking at the map for Teal Bay and um, where the road goes in has actually been washed away, so we're waiting for that to be repaired. So it's lucky we didn't allow camping there. But um, I still um, look at Wananaki, and um, we've got camping grounds right, um, people are able to park in the area and then camp in tents in the view of um, several camping grounds, and that's going to be very interesting. And I just formally invite everybody to come out on Sunday to the Wananaki AGM, so I won't be alone. Because it'll be very interesting. And had this not been going out to public consultation, then I wouldn't have been able to support it. My main thing is that I hope this will be meaningful consultation and the problems of those people. Because we're allowing tents to go right next to properties that have been there for decades. And so, I hope it's meaningful consultation and we give it due consideration and, and sort of that when it comes in. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Please put my apologies in for Sunday. I'm not going to join you What time was that, Chris? 
Chair. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
waste into toilets, thus stating that self-contained only can be around a toilet. Has this been has this been looked into? Because if you're allowing others that are not self-contained to be able to uh, have used toilet, they can use toilet. But if self-contained who, who don't need to use toilet are away from the toilets, then they're less likely to tip them down a toilet. Has that been looked into? I don't think that's a matter for the bylaw, to be honest. Um, and just to clarify, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that we have um, identified places around public toilets for people who are not self-contained so that they can, under the um, camping and public places bylaw, park and, and, and be there non-self-contained. Um, so that there are issues around um, the environmental impacts of um, putting those chemical toilets around it's mainly a problem with the non articulated sewage, is So, yeah, that's not an, uh, an area that I think we can cover under the bylaw itself. But perhaps it is a, um, a, a topic for our environmental health people to, to address in another forum. So, thank you for raising that. That's a movie. Overall, um, I look forward to this going out. I, I think the introduction of seasonal restrictions is a step forward, and I think it's a great idea that we're proposing overflow sites in town. Um, I want to make a point that's really interesting public perception um, because there's quite a few um, areas of dock land, um, and the community often raise those. Uh, they don't understand that those are actually beyond our control. But um, it will be interesting where the doc do make a submission because I think we really, I know that this is a separate, you're writing the, the bylaw, but I think going forward we need to make sure we have a close relationship with docs so that we're talking about um, those particular areas. Um, I did have a question which is, uh, this was raised by the Tūtukaka ratepayers who said when we do this consultation is there a requirement for people who make a submission to give us their address because they felt strongly that um, when people, you know, that submissions may come, on, come in on us from all over the country, they felt strongly that people who lived locally or lived, you know, at a, close to a Freedom Camp site, that, um, you know, that their views should be, uh, you know, uh, not, not, not necessarily prioritised, but I was just wondering, when people make a submission, do we why would they tell us where they live? Do they have to provide an address? Certainly affected parties. Then. So, through the chair, so under the LGA, there's no requirement for them to provide an address. However, if they want to be heard at the hearing, they've got to provide some for you for that you want to contact. So, they be an email or a phone number. They have to provide a residential or a postal address. Okay. Right, thank you. <coughs> Any further discussion? That's a kind of right, Cool. Um, thank you. Everybody is public. So access to every area is for everybody. It's not just them or us. It's not, not them and them. Everybody needs to be able to make sure that they have fair advantage to get to a location. Whether it's looking at this and potentially allowing people to stay the night and leave in the morning, or not. Everybody are visitors to the location, whether you live close or far. Um, throughout the document as well, it says that campgrounds are not protected. It is competition. It's like a high-class restaurant complaining that a fish and chip shop is allowing then people to come sit outside in, in the park. So realistically, everybody needs to diversify in this changing climate, in the changing economic climate, and making sure offering what the people actually want. When you don't need it, you don't actually need to go to those locations. But I don't need to go out to a restaurant to eat, I'm going to eat at home. But if I want to go out to a restaurant and eat, I will. So we need to be able to provide those opportunities. And thank you very much for all the work you guys are doing. Too. Please don't take my comments as negative towards you. It is just a area that we need to make sure we get right. And if we don't, it's going to come back in our faces. Well, thank you very much. Much more to the consultation.
Thank you, Councillor Pike. Right to replace me head. I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against? Carry. Brings us to item 7.3, the Local Government Funding Agency 2020 Annual Meeting Matters. It does matter, doesn't it? <laughs> As we have a recommendation in the paper, copy one, page 166. No idea where it is now. 169. 169. Okay. Uh, number of recommendations on, on page 166. Do I have a move for those recommendations? Is that please? Seconder. Councillor Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, another good one issue about LGFA. Uh, I know this is um, one of Alan's favourite things. And I do hope Alan, that Alan can go to the to the Wellington annual meeting on the Thursday night, and I just hope he doesn't get stuck in court anyway, so I expect him to come straight home and be part of any violence. But I know I know this is something that often makes council's eyes glaze over. I know when we have discussions about Georgie Bay, it's an incredibly important aspect, and I and I think we should congratulate the for the far sighted people who thought about setting this up in terms of giving us an opportunity for um, long-term, low-interest <coughs> um, funding for local government. So um, I'm happy to move this. My only comment would be, and it's something I raised through you, Madam Chair, when I was first elected, um, I think it would be really good for LGFA to be looking at where it is investing its money in terms of um, the funding being into sustainable projects, and particularly for me, given that this council is a fair you know, we have a fair trade district that we're looking at ethical investing. So that's something I think um, that I'd really like to see LGFA pay some attention to, and I'm sure they are already thinking about that, but I think it's only something that will become more important. So thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Councillor Cutforth. I think um, Robbie Allen is our shared Council representative that can be fed back through around the, the table, those comments. Or perhaps you can respond to that. Chair, um, that's definitely on the agenda. We work very hard to choose Green sustainable bonds um, in the next year. In fact, I'm um, uh, trying to get Tony Wright so we can fund the Civic Centre through a green bond. That's one of the first of that. Yeah. It's very high in the priority. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan, the, the councils would have read the report, but is there anything you wanted to highlight in particular for us? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The main thing is. is First time I've had contested positions for a director role and for shareholders council. Every other cycle since inception, it's been by mutual agreement prior to the meeting. So this is the first time I've had to make recommendations about um, who we should support. Uh, the shareholders council is unanimous in recommending that Mike Tooley retain as the non independent director. Uh, we certainly feel that the time of unsettled financial markets is a need for continuity on the board. We had already seen the board, we would do a full review of the skill composition need going forward, and we want to preempt that by making a change prior to that, despite the other application coming in. Similarly, for the first time, we've had a council trying to come on to the shareholders council, uh, leading to a contest. The same, same reason we think that uh, continuity is critical at this time. Although I hold the representative of the new Plymouth in the in the regard, um, the CFO, the time is not quite right. We'll work with them on the next rotation next year as to whether they come on, should they not get support of this. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yeah, I have a question. That's a matter. How do you, um, when you get people with skills, certain skills onto the board, how do you assess the value of their performance? Do you have regular reviews? Um, do you have external reviews? Or are they just carried out internally? Through uh, the chair, I hope. I'm in regular dialogue with the board chair about how the, um, the board is performing. And also, we conduct um, independent reviews. Uh, there are basically two organisations in the country that we use uh, Crowdfund for that out. We give that an external uh, perspective. We also use them for recommendations, director of remuneration. So individually that happens as well as a whole world. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Any further discussion? Oh, just to say the other thing I guess that's of interest and you know, I think we'll be looking over the next year is the fact that the LGFONA fund CCOs and that's you know a new change and I think that would be something that will look with interest to see how that goes in the next year. But thank you for your Thank you. I'll put the, uh, the motion those in favour aye. Aye. Against? Item 7.4, um, Alan, just before you go, the, um, we have withdrawn the adoption of the uh, annual report, but I just wonder if we could just have a bit of an update on how that's going with audit and what you need. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the audit process was proceeding to an agreed time frame with Audit New Zealand. Um, they said early on that they were under pressure due to the ongoing indication of COVID and the whole annual report program. Um, we pushed them hard to maintain the time over had. It's already been delayed by one month from where we started. Uh, they haven't completed their um, <coughs> process. They have given us verbal clearance that the, um, everything is satisfactory. That's not the same as written clearance. Uh, they did suggest we could adopt today subject to final confirmation and then back to the area of CE to sign off the final report. We have not recommended that because they still conduct reviews as recently as yesterday. Work with we think they should have done it some time ago. Uh, so we're really not happy to proceed on this basis. <coughs> the legislation was changed this year to extend the time for adoption, so we'll bring it back hopefully to the November meeting. Oh, thank you. Okay, that's clear. Okay, that's clear. Yeah. Uh, we'll just put so that brings us to item 8.1, the financial report for the three months ending 30 September. 2020, <coughs> a recommendation on page 188. Can I have somebody moved? Councillor Peters is moving, and Councillor Conop is seconding. Um, thank you for this um, very, very detailed and understandable report. Um, one of the things that I note in it is in light of um, I'm just going to say Councillor Levering, <laughs> Robin Levering's uh, presentation today is that um, the pension and housing budget is <coughs> around 744000 for this current year and the proposed um, improvements budget uh, that we've been discussing is much lower than that. Uh, so for example, on the first year, it's only half of that, four hundred and ten thousand. Is that a um, is that a nominally year and a nominally this year? You know, like is there some major thing that was was funded or proposed to be funded, or is that what you see normally? Councillor Peters, what page is the agenda? Um, <coughs> I think you're in the capital projects report, um, which is the next agenda item. I'm just um, comparing it. Yes, um, but, yeah. but what you're comparing is the, the capital projects um, item, which is actually the next item on our agenda. We're currently on the financial report, um, and 8.2 is the capital projects report. So we'll hold that question right. through, because you're on page two, uh, two, uh, 207. Yes. Yeah. So that's in the next, um, oh, next so item. So if we go back to 188. <laughs> Thank you. Move that, and I'm sure you'll be really keen to move the capital project <laughs> as well as you expect to that. <laughs> so, Councillors, um, just on the uh, yeah, the financial report for the, for the three months, any further comments or questions? Councillor Cutler? Um, just a really naive, dumb question. No such thing. Yeah. Well, I'm just getting in first. <laughs> um, if we have a year to date position of a surplus of five, how can we have a year to date position of a surplus of 5.8 million? when we've been through a COVID situation and lost money? Uh, three years, yeah, it's a very good question, but I asked the team myself. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to say it's good. I am concerned that these COVID promises are false positive. Yeah. Um, the the year date budget is based on phasing given by uh, all by the cost the managers to win those spending money during the year. So we do rely on them that being accurate to give our forecast and any, any position. 
So it may be that the, um, they've said they'll be spending a whole lot of money by this time, actually, they haven't. And they've got their, phase, their budget phasing right. So the year's budget could be right. The workforce during the year could be incorrect. So that could, that could lead to the sort of false positive coming through there. Just checking that everybody else understood that. <laughs> there will be a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also assumptions we made regarding things like operating revenue. Um, uh, and there are various things which are just slightly ahead of where we thought they'd be. So it may be too conservative on some things. That's the case. We fixed that as well. Okay. But I don't think this um, position will hold for the entire <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was just an immediate call for there. Yeah. Excellent question. Any further discussion? If not, I'll put that motion in those in favour. Aye. Aye. Against? <coughs> now page uh, 204. The capital projects report through to September 2020. There's a recommendation that we note the capital report. Three months in the year September. Councillor Peters would love to be there. And Councillor Holmes is seconded. Thank you. Councillor Peters. Um, thank you. Um, the, the same question. Thank you. So just through the chair, you're asking whether the 744000 is a typical budget? That's the budget you made for this year. Is that because you foresaw something specific for this year? Um, or is that just a, was just that a normal figure? The budgets are increased in the last LPP for this activity. Uh, Thank you, Sandra. Through the chair, I've some carryover from the previous year because COVID impacted on our ability to do it. So originally it was a lesser figure? Through the chair, yes, I believe so. Thank you. And you're, you're right in looking at the <coughs> so there is a significant investment in this area proposed in the long term plan. Any further discussion on the capital projects report? Yeah, I've got it. Madam Chair, the, um, it relates back to the graph of 202, page to 202, previous item. But uh, I'm not going to comment too much about it because we had a COVID effect and obviously a lot of things slowed down, and that's understandable. But what happens now is we've got to catch up because on, if you look at the graph of 202, it shows our deadline tumbling down because we're not picking data because we aren't doing the projects. But more importantly, we're now six, sitting on $63.5 million of, of uh, term deposits. That's money we've collected and, and it's just sitting in a bank account to be used. So I'd like to think that the senior management team can provide us with a a catch-up plan about how they're going to spend that money that we're already budgeted for collected and how we're going to correct that, that downline effect. Because the gate pack is reported on the previous gap graph where we've got the little Manhattans and we're already showing well below our projected <coughs> timeline. So I'd like to see how we're going to catch up, how we're going to spend our, our budget and the amount we've collected off our way pass, our year spend. But it's too early, and it's only three months into the year. But uh, the end of the season, the end of the year could be quite drastic if we don't start picking, picking up the projects. Now, if you forwards, will be even more. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Holmes. Um, and I think that the, the graph on page 210 for the capital project expenditure, yeah. our forecast for year end, um, I don't think we're going to be year that we've quite got the um, but we hopefully this year will get close. We've certainly got some big ticket items coming come in with us. Some big projects are handy. Councillor Cockerilla? Yeah, that's very good, Chair. Um, same page 210, uh, the graph below, which actually talks about it, it shows stormwater. And I'm, I'm guessing it's actually saying 95,000, is it? It just says 95. Um, I'm, I'm guessing these are 1,000, but it's below 100% already. And with the amount of works that has to go on uh, for stormwater alone in Fomo A, what what is the realistic figure going to be? Um, I threw it through to the chair that that figure because it's all about be quite misleading. Um, mm. There's very little expenditure budgeted year to date. So it refers back to the capital question in some way, and they're ahead of that by a long way. 
but they ex so they expect to spend 50 grand by this time of the year to actually spend 100 in round numbers. So that's an outlier on the graph. But in, in dollar terms, it's not a huge amount of money. So um, the the annual budget for the year for stormwater, the budget 207, is 1.3 million dollars. Um, every project manager is contesting all, all their money on their projects. I have a less a more conservative view than that. Um, but I would have think that's been a good chunk of that, but it's not a huge budget. Through you, Madam Chair, my concern is the fact that it is not a huge budget, and with the amount of stormwater damage that is actually happening, um, I'm quite conscious that we may need to be looking at that. And yeah, I Focus on, on the, the roadside litter collection, which, which um, and I, good to see that the area of Great North Road is on the radar. Um, what are the priorities for that? And, and, and uh, are there any other? Um, to what extent are we going to do the roadside cleanup? And what are the next priorities? Um, so, through the chair, with the with the roadside litter collection, there is a clause within the funding that we cannot do areas that are funded through other sources. Um, and there are some main arterial roads that have already covered. So what the team has been doing is to highlight the high traffic volume areas, focusing on arterial, uh, arterial and primary collector roads and moving into some of the tourist routes. I haven't got the exact roads that we're going to be doing, but there is a program to, to do that kind of complements those that are already funded. But it is focused on high, high visibility areas within the, within the region. That's a Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment. <clears throat> I think it's, it's really interesting to read this report and um, with the elections that have just happened and um, you know, Labour back in government, I think because there will be that continual striving um, you know, for the local government to look after the full well-beings, I think it's really great that um, you know, our, our, our roading team, the NTA, and our infrastructure team are, you know, this is building into their business as usual uh, approach. <coughs> they, are, they are looking at these uh, social wellbeing outcomes, diversity outcomes, you know, just building these relationships with other um, players around the district, uh, you know, working together, talking, coming up with solutions. I think it's really, really great that we're moving, you know, in this direction and we are, that we're looking after these looking after our community and taking these 
um, other wellbeing considerations. It's very positive. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. No, it's really good to have report, really good to see what's happening. Um, I guess my one of my concerns, or I think one of the challenges we've got, is to try and ensure that there is ongoing employment and permanent employment for these people. And I'm just a little, I'm not so much, well, I guess I'm concerned, but I'm just uh, highlighting, like if you look on page 225, the number of new employees as a result of the contract, there's actually, there's not large numbers um, going into con continual employment, I guess. And I guess my plea, and I don't, it's not necessarily for Calvin, but it might be for Calvin to, to advocate on behalf <coughs> to MB, but specifically MSD, I would have thought, to look at how that import, what one, how the employment can be joined up. So you've got people moving from roadside vegetation clearance to something else, so that there's a continual employment for them, but also how they can be transitioned into permanent. So when you look on two to page two two six at the objectives, the objectives are quite sort of input based, which is fine. I mean, it's great that they're getting Māori, it's great that they're getting women, it's great they're getting young people, it's great that they're getting a percentage of people who have actually lost their jobs through COVID into it. But what's happening at the other end, and are those people moving into permanent employment, or are they just going into a, another temporary rollover position? So I think that's really the challenge for the project in terms of getting, if you like, you know, sustainable employment happening. The other comment I wanted to make is, I mean, having searched through this, it's um, a lot of the jobs, as we said before, the Shovel Ready projects tend to be um, male, more traditionally male jobs, and I'm really pleased to see on Tuesday night, I think it is, that there's a Women in Trades um, event happening through North Tech. And um, while I accept women can do these jobs, and do do these jobs, it would be really good to see um, in the future if there are more jobs that, that appeal more to a broader range of women that we can, we can sort of look at, at, at suppose, I'm not suggesting that we really want another COVID outbreak and lots of PGE funding, but just that, that's another issue I think in terms of most of the jobs continue to be um, predominantly male focused. But yeah, so it's not a no no reflection on our work, but I think it's something that we could do some advocacy on. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Kelvin wanted to respond to that. Um, I just wanted to speak to the first point. Um, we are meeting fortnightly with MSD regarding the, the transition thing post this. Um, we also had a multi council MD and MSD um, workshop about a month ago where the risk was raised of the cliff at the end of this work. Um, so MSD are presently pulling together an overview for the region of all funding activities with the intent of trying to flatten the line um, of funding. Um, there's the future work coming up with the Jobs for Nature that a lot of these people will be able to transition across to. And one of the things we're working on is working with the likes of Otangade Trust to become a more established player in the the workforce provider space along the lines of um, allied workforce used to be in the lights so that they can provide a continuation of employment. Um, pleasingly we've had I think more than 12 of the redeployed workers already pick up permanent roles within contracting organisations so um, a lot of them have been <coughs> trained for t uh, traffic control and are now being taken on with the, with the increased capital program across the region they've, they've been taken on with Thank you. Thanks, Governor. 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 Uh, which is actually a contractor doing work, I'm trying to work out how that actually be <coughs> employment. And then I actually see the pictures and I, I seriously hope there's not a person cutting the tree branch down because the comments in there comments and say how wonderful their safety and innovation is. <coughs> Uh, 
through the chair, there, there was um, the intent of the funding was to follow in regards to employment. One, um, actually three. The first one was to bring on redeployed workers, uh, displaced workers for redeployment for this short period post COVID. Um, the second one was to ensure that companies at risk with future work, workloads were also given opportunity to um, maintain employment and not put people um, out of work. Um, and then finally the third component was the fact that it was recognised a number of these areas were skilled um, areas, particularly in the hazardous tree removal component. And in those cases we took on established contractors and required them to take on additional labour to complement. So you'll notice in the total jobs column I think it's about 190 something, whereas the actual redeployed is 98. So the difference between the two is the existing contractor staff. Um, with respect to that question, yeah, it's an automated machine, um, and that is the safe way of, of, of reducing those. Through you, also, Madam Chair, when it comes to these works that have, have been highlighted here, a lot of them, they appear to be business as usual and they should have been part of the contracts for the roading team to do. As well as when I used to run the contracts, it was part of the contract process. So how have these jobs come out of the normal AU and now having to be done as a separate fund? Um, through the chair, the, the, as I mentioned before, the funding requires only works that are not funded in the next 18 months. Um, the ones, the jobs that have been identified are those that fall below the funded defect line. So in previous meetings I mentioned about the categorisation of defects. High priorities are funded and resolved, but there is a group of lower priority jobs. With respect to self-seeded and some of these hazardous trees, they're ones that would likely need doing in two to three years' time under the normal maintenance programme. What this has given us the opportunity to do is get ahead and actually cut some of these areas prior to them actually being a problem. Um, and that's been the primary intent. There may be one or two in there that should have been part of BAU, but in those cases it's when we have a stretch of road and for efficiency purposes we might as well do the one as well as the other 10 trees that aren't quite meeting the contract requirements. The, the main intent of this is getting ahead of the game and being able to use this money to prevent future issues as opposed to necessarily fixing today's issues which are part of the maintenance contract. Councillor Innes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just uh, following on from Councillor Cutthor's uh, comments, really looking at sustainable employment opportunity and I see phasing into jobs uh, for nature, that's uh, very much at the forefront and will be uh, related to um, uh, pest management and also weed control. Uh, is, is there any uh, budget for training involved with this? Because it seems to me that uh, part of sustainable uh, employment opportunity relates to um, skill enhancement. Um, through the chair, there's, there's two ways that we're facilitating training through. Um, this program. One is direct um, the direct cost of this funding. Um, so in some cases we've already put um, staff, um, really staff through chainsaw training, basic health and safety units, standards, grow safe and the lights and traffic control. Um, in addition to that we just initiated a conversation with MSD. They've been attempting to, to catch up on this with respect to some funding that they have. But they've now advised that they have some training fund available to facilitate through NEFTEC and a couple of other providers for these reinforcements. So that's something we're working on at present to try and facilitate that through the same process. That's good. Thanks. That's the house. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I brought this up before and it's still a concern to me. I said, we just had a gender right up here. It actually shows nothing, doesn't show now any of our plans, our annual plans or our long term plan or anything. And it's a debate we should have had, I feel, and not, we should have had it. We're meant to be an infrastructure based council, now we're getting to the social part of, of life. And so I've asked before, how does the audit, how does audit New Zealand see this? Because we're now discussing 
our involvement in an outside organisation which is government funded, following government process, we as councillors have had no input into this spend. And yet we were sitting around here talking about it. We've had no input into this at all. And yet we've got staff working on it. So there's a disconnect between the government's role and the management's role. And that needs to be clarified. I've asked, you know, I don't mind bringing it up to all of New Zealand, but I want to make sure that we are aware that we're getting into something we haven't got a mandate to do. At the moment, we have not got a mandate to do this work. We've got either to think. We've had, as councillors, we haven't had, you know, it's maybe 100% good, but we should have had a discussion about it. We now, like I said, we've got our, our manager here who's employed by the Ray Alliance doing, doing a lot of stuff that's probably outside his job description. Are we happy with it? It's the implication. And Audit New Zealand should have been able, once we started getting in these, these subsidised money from the government, there should have been paper come from Audit New Zealand saying, this is how we're going to handle it through your books. Because we councillors are responsible for our budgets. No one else. Councillors. And you know, I'm not comfortable in the role. And I've been here, I've asked these questions often enough to start getting some answers back. If you councillors are all happy in this role, fine. But I'm not. And I'm going to keep asking questions. If I've got to go to order New Zealand and order the general myself, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hoss, I think um, the, the issue that you raised um, was covered in the agenda item when we approved um, the, the budget because we had to be the, the agency for this contract around the, the region and I do recall that that was um, discussed and raised at, at the time uh, and uh, but but as to all that I'll, I'll defer to Alan on that one. Uh, through the chair where this funding was first on the table from UB we took uh, tax advice through Price Water House Coops, advisors as to how we process these transactions on behalf of all the councils. Also, we get a follow-up regarding the processes for the accounting of that, which we sent to New Zealand for their, um, uh, their feedback, and they're very happy with all the range of the Can I have a copy of that then, please? Thank you for the group, hopefully that will allow you fees, but yes, we'll make it um, all councillors get a copy of that. Thank you. Councillor Martin. To be fair <coughs> to the staff, we got money from the PGF, the NBIE, to fund a whole scheme. <laughs> money that was made available to us and the staff had to act quickly, it had to be done, but it had all of these things that we needed to have employment and everything. I know <coughs> the firms who have picked up workers who have been on this scheme, they've had additional training so they can do the job and as soon as they get a reputation as being a good worker, they're they, they, they taking so, the, the infrastructure community is just looking anywhere to find people. We've got a whole lot of people here who are getting additional training, additional skills, <coughs> learning the health and safety, that I'm certain most of them will move into a boom. And I think that this is going to work out much better so that we have a bigger pool of people for the uh, our construction community. And it'll work. It's going to go. Thank you. I just want to pick up though on Councillor Holmes does raise a good point and, and Councillor Martin has touched on it with the, the, all the money that comes from central government we have to be we have to be aware we have to be aware that we still yep. must be man, we must be mandated by a community to do these projects you know we've got our long term plans and I think the answer there is we have to work much more closely with central government and our MPs so that we can be on the same page. Otherwise, we do get money through TIF, we do get money through PGF, and if government is directing as to where that money should be spent, that's kind of what Councillor Anna was talking about yesterday. It's a lot. It's an erosion of local democracy in a way, in a way. But it's just something we need to be aware of. I just also wanted to throw in, um, for and I know Calvin is the manager of the NTA, but in these conversations with MB, I just want to put this out there, that um, working towards a circular economy, so at the moment we're thinking jobs for nature, but there is a massive opportunity um, when it comes to 
reduction of waste. Recycling creates 10 times the number of jobs than waste to landfill. And reusing, so jobs in reusing materials and repurposing them creates 30 times the number of jobs in sending waste to landfill. So I just want to put out that what we need to be thinking as a council, we need to be forward thinking, we need to be thinking how can we capitalise possibly on money from central government that is going to help us reduce waste and create jobs and the waste sector is an area that we could look at um, and start thinking how can we, you know, how can we be creating jobs and reducing waste. Thank you. Um, just first thing I just wanted to ask a question is how do we get half a person in the point five? So the half a person relates to a uh, an existing employee who is supervising for part of the time. So the the, the, the contract is required to make a report based on FTE. So if you've got someone spending half their time on this project, they're reporting it as half an FTE. So that would be a job type then rather than half a person. Yeah. Anyway, um, the fact that all of these items here are all maintenance, are all rubbish, are all tree clearing, are all these, this, that, and the other, it shows that we need to be able to put these more into what we are putting into our contracts. Rather than just being a reactive, we need to be more proactive to be able to keep on top of this. People are expecting it, but at the same time, these things, these things are impacting us. They impact our our roadsides, impact our walkability, impact everything that we have to do with these things. Um, making sure that the jobs are able to be able to continue would be really great to be able to see because obviously when the fund dries up, then the money comes from somewhere. And if we're expecting, if these people are contracted to us, then obviously that may impact how much we're paying them too, potentially, um, depending on what we're expecting from them. So it's, I counted up the, um, the rubbish that, they, that they've already collected from the roadside and it's over two tons, it's two tons. And that's just that, that, those few roads. Um, and it, it's out there because it's a social issue. It is a problem that people are just throwing things out the window in their cars. Yes, there are also potential, the trucks that may be driving down the road are losing things um, from, the, from the contractor's vehicles, which I've had, had, had comments about. Um, I don't know if that's been addressed or not, but it, the amount of people I've seen throwing other stuff out is would be a hell of a lot more. Um, making sure we have appropriate receptacles so that when we are putting things on the roadside, also making sure that people aren't overfilling things as well. And opportunities through recycling and different sources of reusing and minim waste minimization. These are the <coughs> issues that are addressed through here that if we don't deal with them, Gonna get messier, again. and we just need to keep it, on, keep it keep it in mind because everybody creates waste, regardless of if you buy a shirt, if you buy a, a, an apple, whatever you have, there's waste associated with it. Which how you do deal with that is what we need to make sure we are addressing, and that feeds back to even even with freedom capping and things in the previous one as well about people complaining about rubbish that they are leaving at one point. Because even parties, people were going to a beach and stuff like that, it was not always great waste. And then that blows out. And then it blows <coughs> out and so on. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Any further discussion? I'll put the motion. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against? Okay. Um, before, it brings us to the closure of our open portion of the meeting. But before I ask, um, Move into confidential here. Um, there will be a supplementary uh, item coming on to the confidential um, portion of our agenda, so it, it's an extraordinary item. Uh, so I need to have a motion. I'll read it before you move, you might not want to. Um, it reads subject to the agenda being circulated, confidential item 1.4, a property matter distributed separately but not within the time frame specified in the Goima. Whangarei District Council standing was 9.12, require a council 
a resolution to deal with the items of business that cannot be delayed. The item was not included in the agenda for the reason that it has only recently come to our notice that property agency road is suitable for strategic purposes has become available. And councillor asked to consider this item at today's meeting so that staff can enter negotiations forthwith. So the um, uh, motion would read that council consider item 1.4 property matter at this meeting. It's been moved by Councillor Pocorillo and seconded by Councillor Benny. I'll put that motion. Those are aye. Aye. Against Harry. Further resolution, um, we uh, to allow a member of the public to attend our meeting. I need a um, mover for a recommendation that Peter O'Rourke, agent, be permitted to remain at this meeting other than the public has been excluded because of his knowledge of item 1.4. Mr. Ogle's specialised knowledge will be of assistance in relation to the matter to be discussed. Oh, okay. Councillor Martin is moving, Councillor oh, Anderson seconding those in favour. Aye. Those against. Carried. Sorry, Councillor Pablo. Perhaps we'll cover that question once we're in. Now, I need somebody to move us into confidential. Councillor Martin, Councillor Peters. Reasons that are included. Those in favour, aye. Aye. Against, carried. Thank you to our member of the media. Thank you to our member of staff who's been um, live streaming.